We're going through the Anchored series, and this week's reading is all about Galatians. So please turn to Galatians chapter 5 for our message, Fruit Trees and Factories. If you need a Bible, raise your hand. Our service team will get one of those to you. Just raise your hand up high, and you're going to make your way to Galatians chapter 5. And the reality is that uh, this passage, having taught this so many times in the 35 years of being a pastor, um, I thought I would do a little... uh, overview for the big picture because it's really easy to dig down. Each one of these things are really a message in and of themselves, Where whether it's the uh, fruit trees of the nine aspects of the fruit of the spirit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and faithfulness, and self-control. We could talk about that one at a time. We could talk about those nine, or we could talk about the 17 revelations of the works of the flesh, which is just our, fl- our body is a sin factory. It just produces and produces and produces. It's just like the ground. Do you ever have to plant weeds around your house? No, they just grow. Now, you've got to plant good things. You've got to plant a tomato plant. You've got to water it. You've got to prune it. You've got to tend it. You've got to babysit it. You've got to take care of it. But the weeds just go crazy, right? And if you have a large piece of property, you begin to hate weeds. I grew in great hatred towards weeds in my seventh grade year because I had to pull four to five foot kosher weeds out uh, for my dad at his farm. He had 40 acres and planted in beans. And I had two jobs, pull weeds and kill rock chucks. And so that's what my job description was. That's a very redneck Idaho job description. And um, the one was fun and the other one was totally the pits. But what you realize, it was full-time work on this farm taking care of what just naturally occurred. And in this passage of Scripture, Paul the Apostle is trying to help us show the difference between two different approaches to your life in Jesus. One is discovering why you have so much difficulty with just your natural default of sin that just bubbles up out of you. It's no work at all. You wake up in the morning, there it is. You went to bed at night, there it was. You wake up in the morning, there it is. Hello, right? I have this fallen sinful nature. And if you only knew this one aspect, we would just close our Bibles, go suck our thumbs at home because it'd be very depressing. You ever get depressed over your own sin and failure? You ever get sick of yourself? You ever just think, what is my problem? And if you're not thinking it, I promise you, your spouse is. What is their problem? (laughs) <laughs> we have a new joke in our family because my two-year-old grandson, when he says problem, he says problem. And he'll look at you and go, you've got a problem. <laughs> and I feel a little bit like that when I look at this passage. I go, i got a problem. <laughs> and what's that problem? It's me. My own sin factory that grows. And i got to deal with that. So how do I choose a different life, a life in the spirit that is fruitful and beautiful because works and fruit are two different things. And as we go through this, I'd like to go through more of a uh, 30,000 feet view and then share with you some things I've learned along the way that help me be a more fruitful Christian. I've been working at it for almost 40 years. Actually, uh, next year it will be 40 years of coming to Jesus, and I can't believe he hasn't brought me further along. I'm re- I apologize for myself. I want to ask you guys to forgive me for who I am. After 40 years, I should be a lot further along. But I guess the children of Israel were in the wilderness 40 years, so I'm just getting ready to go to the promised land. (laughs) Having said that, let's stand up and read this passage together. And I'm going to read it slowly. I pray the Spirit of God does even a work in the couple of minutes it takes to read this in your soul and my soul. Because that's what each one of us have come here longing for for more of the Spirit of God to do what he wants to do in our life. We begin at verse 16. It says, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law, 
Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murder, drunkenness, revelries. And you go, oh, I dodged all 17 of those. I'm not any of those things. He polishes you off with the last few words, and the like. That's not a complete list. You're under the like. Of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. If the flesh dominates my life, it proves I'm not born again. I'm not even a Christian. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, Peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Lord, please help us. Most of us are a hot mess most of the time and really need your help. And so we're just going to be so open and honest with you, Lord, that apart from you, we know we, we just can't be fruitful. Left on our own, Lord, we look so much like that long list that's in the flesh. And yet each of us that, of us that know you, Jesus, as our Savior, we long for a more godly life. We long for a more fruitful life. We long for those beautiful description of the fruit of the Spirit. And yet, Lord, sometimes it feels just out of reach. So we pray that today you would illuminate our hearts, illuminate our minds. Give us insight, Lord, by your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Let's be seated. All right. Well, first of all, as we think about fruit trees and factories, because there's really different words that describe what what your flesh produces, and it's described as works, like you would think of a factory, works, and all that goes along with the noisy clatter and the um, pollution that comes along with that. But then the fruit trees, nothing more peaceful or serene. You go through an area where there's orchards, and there's just these beautiful rows of trees, and especially when the fruit's about ready to harvest, and they're, they're bulging with fruit. If it's citrus, you can actually smell the citrus. And there's something peaceful and beautiful and natural and organic and good when you have that kind of experience. And so we want to see a contrast because these are the illustrations that Paul the Apostle is giving to us. Now first, factories and orchards usually don't go together because you have a planning and zoning problem, right? If you've ever done planning and zoning, I've done a lot of building projects through the years. And even recently, I was thinking about a piece of property. I did the call. I I spent probably over an hour with county officials that sent me to city officials and back to county officials. And this is the way it goes with uh, government agencies. And you finally are trying to get down to the bottom line of what can you really do? What can go in this piece of ground? Could I plant an orchard there? Could I do it a factory? What, What could I do? Obviously, I wasn't interested in either one of those things, but for our sake here today, the planning and zoning problem is your heart. These two things are inside of you. Now that orchard and that factory, that stinky, smelly factory and that beautiful orchard are living and growing side by side in each one of us. And this is the description that he gives for us, is that if we walk in the Spirit, This means a simple life that I've made a decision to walk with Jesus. You know, I walk. The Bible talks about the Christian walk oftentimes. It loves this illustration. The first time we see that, that, you know, the Lord came in the cool of the day to talk with Adam and Eve. And just a couple of chapters later, we see that Enoch says he walked with God and he was not for God. Took him to heaven. In Genesis chapter 5. So why is this theme of walking that goes all the way through the scriptures? Because you see, walking takes two things. It basically takes a decision to walk and the motion towards that direction if I'm walking in the spirit creates balance. You know, we're bipods, meaning we have two feet, obviously. We're not quads. And so the bipod means that once I take a step, 
If I don't take that other step, what happens? Pretty soon I'm gonna fall over. Stepping is a motion. Now I can stand like this. The Bible says, stand therefore in the power of God, in the full armor of God. So when I stand, I'm taking a posture, once again, in the spirit to resist the satanic, the, the attacks that come at me from the world, the flesh, and the devil. So my standing posture is one of stability and willing to take on what's ever in front of me by the grace of God and the power of the spirit in my life. But when I'm walking in the spirit, I have to make a decision, right, where I'm going to walk. I decide to walk to Starbucks. So I'm walking, right? Because I have to keep, if I'm in motion, I can't take one step and go, leave church. And that's what some of you, hey, I'm going to go walk in the I'm going to go sow to the Spirit. I'm going to go spend time with the things of the Spirit at church today, right? You got ready. You took a shower. You made a decision. You got in your car. And you even walked from the park. You had to put one foot in front of the, What if in the middle of that you just went, I don't think I want to, Right? We're like, how come all these people are doing a standing yoga pose out in the parking lot? Because you chose not to come in. You see, walking in the spirit is a decision. I decide to take a step, and then it's continuation. So I have desire to walk, I make a decision to walk, and then I continue to move in the things of the spirit. It's just a simple motion that describes a walk. You can walk with God or away from God, correct? You can make a decision to take a step a different way and walk a different path. So, he says, if we walk in the spirit, we shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Because when I'm choosing here, I bet, I mean, this is like a no-brainer. But here you are, you are walking, you've made a decision to come here today. And I doubt if any of you right now are doing anything heinous in a sinful way. Except for a few of you that are prideful thinking this guy has nothing to tell me whatsoever. But that's a silent thing, right? That's a sin of the attitude, which we'll get to that one. And you're part of the like. But you're not going to do other things because you've made a decision to be here. You could be somewhere else in some sinful activity. Is this correct? Right? You guys made a decision. Here you are. God bless you guys. First step. Woo! We're rock stars. <laughs> Because it seems so funny, right? And, and I also, if I walk in the Spirit, when I'm just reading my Bible at home, I'm usually not doing something terrible either. Why? Because I'm walking in the Spirit. I'm reading God's Word. I'm, if I'm listening to Bible study, if I'm listening to praise music, if I'm, if I'm engaged in good things, engaged or motion in good things, I'm walking in the Spirit. I'm not fulfilling the lust of the flesh. As a matter of fact, I'm not even thinking about the things of the flesh. Why? Because I'm focused on what I'm doing. So I'm walking in the Spirit. For the flesh, in verse 17, lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish, but if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now, he has spent the whole book of Galatians to get us to this point to say, you've got two approaches to this relationship with God. You can try to be under the law, which is legalism, and you are going to be so frustrated, man. How many of you have tried to live up to a list of rules or commitments and continue, 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 continue to fail, but keep promising. You gotta keep trying. <laughs> you gotta stop trying and you gotta start trusting. This is the difference. This is the switch that gets flipped. I'm gonna trust Jesus for his help and his goodness and his forgiveness and the power of his spirit. So I go from, I'm trying, you give me that list. I'll pull myself up by my own bootstraps. I'm gonna be a spiritual God. I'm gonna read my Bible. I'm gonna pray. I'm gonna be a good, godly individual. <laughs> Big fail, right? Last a day, last a week. Last a, you were here, some of you, you were here last Sunday. I'm just telling you, you were making big promises last Sunday. And you've been a mess all week. You didn't keep none of those promises you made last Sunday. Here you are. And this is the difficulty, isn't it? The flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And I want to encourage you in a tremendous, I, I mean, this may seem like a small thing to you, but this was a huge encouragement. If you love Jesus and you really want to have a greater work of God's spirit in your life, but you're struggling and failing, I want you to know what a positive thing that is. By what I mean is that people that are dead spiritually struggle against nothing. 
It is proof that you are alive in Jesus because you want more of God's work and spirit in your life. Amen? You want more love. You want more joy. You want more self-control. You want, you know, God to help you subdue your anger. You want more patience in your life. You long for those things, and you're struggling to obtain those things, and the frustration is between my desire to get there and to be this person and not doing that. I want you to know that's one of the most encouraging things you're going to leave here today with because you are alive in Jesus, or you would not even have that struggle. So give yourself a hand. Amen. That was almost like a golf clap. You really don't believe it, but it's okay. I'm going to take whatever I can get. Because the reality, somebody came up to the famous British preacher, Charles Spurgeon, and said, oh, Pastor Spurgeon, I'm, I'm just struggling. And before the guy could finish his sentence, he said, praise God, like he had finished the sentence. He said, no, I, don't you understand? He goes, I know you told me you're struggling. I want to praise God because... Dead horses don't struggle. You're alive, that's why you're struggling. You're alive. And God has put a new heart of flesh inside of you, and that new heart and that true heart wants all God has for you. You are no longer trapped in Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is desperately wicked, you know. Who can know it? I have a new heart because the Bible says in that new covenant that Jeremiah promised us, we're going to get a new heart. So I have this new heart that's fighting for spiritual space to be the guy I want to be. I want to be a godly man. I sincerely do. I want to be a godly husband. I really do. I want to be a loving father. I really do. These are things I long for inside of me. I want to be a better man. Don't you want to be a better man or a better woman? Don't you want to be a better mom or a better wife? What is it? Where's that longing come from? It is a spiritual aching in your heart to be all that God wants you to be. And without that heart that desires it, you'll never pursue it. So praise God. We're a group. We should just call the church the first, the first church of the struggling and weak. I don't know if we'd have very many people come. Maybe we couldn't even contain the numbers, right? You know, what's the name of the church? I go to that church, the first church of the struggling and the weak and helpless, and they're a basket case. Is that the really? The, yeah, that's the name of the church. <laughs> because only people that are alive in Jesus with a new heart's desire struggle. People dead in their sins, they don't struggle with anything. They just go downstream. They're just like a dead fish floating with the flow. So, but if I'm led by the Spirit... I have this desire that is, is good and godly and spiritual in nature to be who God wants me to be, but some people try to substitute lists of rules and laws to get there. And it's all based upon your effort, right? That you do, 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 do. I got I to gotta do, 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 do all this. Stuff. No. When I go from trying to trusting Jesus, I'm saying, I got to do this. I got to do this. I got to do this or God's not. No. I trust what Jesus has done. Instead of do, 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 it's done. Jesus has done the work. It, it is done. So now, because it's done, I can trust in that finished work. And the place of strength and power for a weak person is trust, trusting the one who's strong, the one who's able, the one who can help us on the inside. And then when he helps us, he gets all the glory because you and I know we're a mess, right? We know that. So, we give him the glory. Now, you think about human factories. Just check out a few of these pictures. These guys with hard hats. This, uh, these people are producing something on an assembly line in this next one. And the, this third one, just it's, it's, a, it's a stink factory. <laughs> Where I grew up, there was a uh, sugar factory. If you guys are not familiar with sugar factories, we grew sugar beets where I was from. They're like this uh, two-pound white beet that we would harvest. And, I mean, at my earliest age, I was helping with a beet harvest when I was five years old. I couldn't even, you know, I'm picking up this two-pound beet and trying to crawl up the side and throw it over the, the edge. They haul those to this factory, and it's really a poor, it, their process is at the sugar factory. They can only get about 15 to 20 percent uh, of sugar out of this beet, whereas it, they would have been out of business a long time ago because sugar cane's a rock star producer of sugar. There's no way the two can compete because the, you, it takes so many sugar beets. Well, the problem is, is that the sugar beet factory fills 
the valley with his stench. Now, the byproduct's great, right? It, it, people have jobs. The farmers are growing beets. It's this great thing. But, man, the smell. Oh. And if you've never sh- smelled a sugar beet factory, and we, we just grew up with that smell. Hopefully, uh, when the wind was blowing a certain way, you didn't have to put up with it so much. But the pollution that's coming out of it and the smell that's coming out of it. Down the road, I moved to another town in Idaho called Pocatello, and they had two big fertilizer factories, Simplot and FMC. They produce phosphorus, and it's quite a prosperous. And and in the winter, when the inversion came along the foothills uh, in Pocatello, the inversion would just put the stench, the sugar beet, I mean the the, uh, FMC, the phosphorus plant, fertilizer. We used to call it Smokatello instead of Pocatello. Because it's in the winter time. If you go to Lewiston, Idaho, they have these paper mills. And Lewiston's this great place where these rivers come together, the Snake River and the Clearwater. And it's this uh, really agriculturally rich place. But because of the paper mill, oh, the stench. Wherever these factories are, there's this smell. Now, something's produced out of them. And so people put up with the smell, you put up with the byproduct, you put up with the waste because of, you know, you're producing something. And even on your worst day, you're producing something. It might not be pretty and it may be stinky, but you are producing something. This is what he describes the flesh as in verse 19 through 21. As I mentioned, there are 17 things. And I'm not going to spend much time here because this is like reading our autobiography, you know what I mean? I am, I am these things. The first four are sexual in nature, adultery, obviously anything that's sexual outside of marriage, fornication, sex if you're not married, Uh, uncleanness and lewdness are also connected to some kind of sexual activity. We throw in pornography today, and about 60% of men in America are getting their sexual satisfaction from pornography today, and when you do the statistics in the church, it's exactly the same as out in the world. And so it's this thing with a click. You know, when I was a kid, it was embarrassing. You had to go to a store. You had to buy magazines. You definitely just wanted to find a friend that had them because you're not going to go buy one at the store. But now with the click and the videos, guys are swept away. It's like crack cocaine for people that like sex. It's like heroin, man. It's, it's an addiction. It is the plague of our generation. You just throw it in there. You got adultery, you got fornication, you got uncleanness, you got lewdness. In verse 20, you have idolatry. That means anything that we give the greatest affection to in our life that's not the Lord is idolatry. Sorcery is pharmakia, which is we get where we get pharmace- pharmacies and pharmaceuticals. So people are just into drugs, right? And as a more drug, uh, legal drug use, just because something's legal, does God <laughs> want it in your body? Is it good for you? Uh, You know, I just wanted you guys to know I dropped some psychedelics to help me with this message today. And I'm seeing those wonderful tracers. Oh, did you see that? Right. So people are tapping into all kinds of things, whether it's the the drug world. And uh, I had a friend that I was always sharing Jesus with him, but he would be smoking this joint after we, we had a company rig, and he would, when we got off work, he'd smoke a joint. And he'd take a big hit off his joint, and he'd go, God made every herb in the field, dude. You know, it's the only Bible verse he knew. And just, uh, but there's hatred, right? I mean, you may not, you go, ooh, sexual sin's so bad. You go, oh, I don't love, I'm not an idolater. I'm not into drugs. You just have hatred for people. You hate your coworker. You hate your ex-husband. You hate your son-in-law. You hate your neighbor because he's got a dog that won't stop barking. You hate him and his dog. In your dreams, you think of a deep, deep hole. You can put them both, and they can die together. You got deep hatred. No, you got contentions. You love to fight with your spouse. Maybe you're a wife that just has a sharp mouth. Can't wait for the husband to get home so you can give it to him. Share all your thoughts. You're going to give him a piece of your mind. And you've been giving so many pieces away, everybody's wondering if you've got any left. You love to argue. You love to fight. You're contentious. 
jealousies. Jealousies, you get obsessed with holding on to relationships. You see, jealousies, I'm trying to keep what's all mine. You get away from what's mine. Then there's outbursts of wrath. You have an explosive temper, but you blow it off. You blame it on your ethnic heritage. I'm sorry about that. You know, I'm Irish. Have you discovered every nationality has that temper, right? I'm Irish, I'm Scott, whatever. My grandfather was such a giggly guy, but when he exploded, it was so scary. But then he comforted himself because he was only a raging, scary, terrifying maniac for about five minutes. And then it was all over. And he'd laugh and giggle. He didn't have to say sorry to anybody. He just, it's like a bomb went off and the whole family was like. He's like, oh, we're all good now. I got it all taken care of. He's throwing stuff. And, but how it's affecting everybody around you, you have selfish ambition. All of life's about me. I want this. I want that. I want this. In the marriage, it's about me. In the family, it's about me. At work, it's about me. Everything's about me. Wherever you have selfish ambition, you have every evil thing. You have dissension. Some people just love to cause divisions. Some people are into heresies, which means building little sex, special little messages, and then siphoning people off to be their own little cult. There are people that are envious, which means you feel ill will towards the blessing of another, which is one of the most twisted of all these human nature things that I've had. When I look at somebody that's really blessed, and why, why does that bother me? Why would their blessing? Because it's envy. I not only want what they have, but I'm disgusted that they have it and I don't. And some of you are looking at me like you do not know what I'm talking about. We're going to get to you and the like. Right? Sama yadas. All these things are just so terrible. I'm so holy. I just wake up with a halo around my neck. Okay. I'm so good. And all these other people that they just, I don't know. They have problems. They need counseling, you know, but I don't envy and I don't murder. I haven't killed anybody. I haven't been drunk lately. Revelries, which means partying. I'm not into the partying and the like. No, you're just juicy for others that fail in some way because your great sin is gossip. You love the juicy morsels. You love to find out what's going on and tell everybody. Have you heard? <laughs> Have you? Oh, so excited. <laughs> you're going to share. You delight in exposing everybody's heartache. There's no compassion for them that, hey, maybe they're struggling. No, it's your great thrill in life is spreading the news. I'm spreading the news. <laughs> it's not New York. At New York, it's, you know, have you heard about Bill lately? All these things, he ends by saying, and the like. This is not to be meant to be an exhaustive list, but each one of us know these things have emanated from us, inside of us. I woke, the day I was conceived, I was headed towards fulfilling these things. I didn't become a sinner because I got older and then sinned. I, be, I sinned because that's what my nature is without Jesus. That's what your nature is. If you have a question about total depravity, which means that every part, your entire total being has been tainted or affected by sin in some way. It doesn't mean you can't do good things or go to work or love your kids or anything. It means that every part of your being has been tainted by sin. And if you question that, have children and you'll no longer question that. All your children will prove from their earliest age, do you have to tell them to lie? Do you have to teach your kids to lie? Do you have to tell them to be selfish? Do you have to tell them to be mean? Do you have to teach them how to club their sibling with a toy while they pull their hair? Do you have to teach them that move? Right? That just happens. Why does that just happen? Because they are manifesting what? That they're fallen creatures just like you and me. When we become adults, we're just a little bit more tactful about it. But sin still manifesting itself. Now, he tells us, which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. 
Now, the word practice means that that's your lifestyle. That's your lifestyle. Now, when you're a Christian, these things become less and less as you grow, right? You get saved and you go through this journey. As I said, next year, I'll have been walking with Jesus for 40 years and I can't believe I'm not further along in my walk with Jesus than I am. It's kind of embarrassing. Hopefully I still have a job next week. Because these things still reside inside of me, right? But my desire is to walk in the spirit. But the whole, as I tried to encourage you at the beginning, that it's even a struggle for you says you're born again. You're not that same person you were a year ago or five years ago or 10 years ago or 20 years ago or however long ago you came to Jesus. You're not that same person because you're growing, right? The Bible says you go from glory to glory to glory to glory. It is this ever revealing, as with unveiled faces you behold, as in the mirror, the glory of the Lord, we're being changed into his image. As we go through life, we become, we start looking more in our actions like Jesus, right? How Jesus would act. That's just what happens. He's forming us. It says that the Lord has predestined us to be conformed to his image, Jesus' image, that when I am, I'm growing in the Lord, I should look more and more like the kindness of the Lord. That's what I should look like. One that is courageous and not afraid of man and all the different aspects. So that's what factories look like. And this is the factory verse of all factory verses. Jesus tells his disciples in Matthew 15, 19, for out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornication, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. He said, because they were thinking that they ate food with unwashed hands and somehow that defiled them. He goes, that doesn't, defile. you know what defiles you? What's coming out of your heart, dude? <laughs> that's, that's what defiles you. That's what would make you really super ugly and uh, you are the stink factory at the house producing your rage and your lust and your all, the, all these things. It's like, without Jesus, that's who we are. So we don't want to be that guy. We don't want to be that guy. We want to grow. And we're on the journey. All of us are on the journey together. It's not a straight line. Wouldn't it be great if it was a straight line? I got saved here, and it's a straight line to glory. No, it's more like this squiggly, like up and down and all over the place, and I did great for three, three months, and oh, now I'm on my face for two months, and now I'm, you know, you have all these seasons in your life and your growth. You can look back and say, man, I was really close to the Lord through that period of time. How about the last, not so much the last six months, <laughs> right? It, it's a journey, and I, I want to encourage you in this because the Lord knows for you and I, he knows our frame that we're dust. This, the scripture declares, he knows, our, he knows who we are. He knows we have this struggle. He, he's telling us about it right here. You guys got a conflict going on. It's a civil war inside of your own soul to do the right thing that God has revealed to you by the power of the spirit or go to your default and be the old you. And since God knows this, the Christian life is not perfection. The Christian life is a direction. I'm walking towards Jesus. I'm getting closer to the Jesus. I'm starting to be, look more like Jesus. Am I perfect? No. Will the sinful nature be eradicated from my body in this life? No. But as I grow in the spirit and I feed the spirit, I can get stronger so that more of the fruit of the spirit begins to grow from, flow from me. So we turn to that. I love fruit trees, don't you? Especially when they're ripe and you can enjoy it. Look at this pomegranate tree here. How about this orange tree? I love orange trees. How about this pear tree? My wife and I were staying at this place up in Santa Barbara. We were there for two weeks and they had just, they had an avocado tree, this ginormous, the largest avocado tree I'd ever seen. They had the citrus, so we had fresh squeezed orange juice out of the backyard. We had avocados. We had this incredible fruit for the two weeks that we were there, and we just were so spoiled rotten by this fruit. And it's flowing off this, these, these trees. But you see, fruit trees are different than factories. When I tell you, as we see here, the nine descriptives of the fruit of the Spirit, now the, the Greek word fruit is singular. It's like this is the, the fruit, and then you have nine descriptives of that fruit. And the first is uh, the fruit of the Spirit is love. This is agape love. This is not an emotion. And this is our problem as Americans. We look at agape love as an emotion. The Lord told his disciples, I give you a new commandment to love one another. 
Can you command an emotion? If I look at you right now and say, I command you to be happy. I command you, well, I could probably get you to be angry just with a couple words, but can I command a, a, an emotion out of you? No. The description of love, as I began to read God's word, that's him talking to me. That's me sowing to the spirit. And I began to talk to him. You see, that's a relationship. I'm walking with God. I'm talking to God in prayer daily. And then I'm reading his word. That means he's talking to me. We have this beautiful relationship going on. That's how you grow in the life of the spirit. And then you do it for a long time and you just continue to be changed from glory to glory through the power of the spirit. It is a decision, but it is not the effort of, uh, it's not willpower, but it's a decision of the will. I start this process in the same way I came to Jesus. It wasn't willpower that saved my soul. No, I repented. That means I turned my mind from what I thought was fulfilling and I turned it towards Jesus and I put my faith and trust in him. Repentance and faith is how I came to Jesus. Repentance and faith is how I trust in the work of the Holy Spirit. Repent changing my mindset, because really this is a mindset. All of us are pursuing happiness. Every single one of you in this room are pursuing satisfaction in this life. And you think that the flesh has something to make you happy about. Something in the flesh. And yet the spiritual life is saying, no, the real realm where there's fulfillment is in the realm of the spirit. I've created this sanctuary inside of you. There's this desire to worship. And so as I worship the Lord, as he talks to me through his word, as I talk to him in prayer, as I spend time with his people, what are they doing? They're worshiping the Lord and they're talking to the Lord and he's talking to them and we grow with one another. And it's this realm of the spirit that is not a physical dimension, but it happens in real time. And it begins to produce, I don't say, you know, I just wake, wake up, with, if this is the fruit of the Spirit, right? If I'm an aggressive type A, which I confess I am, and I look at this, and I go, this is the fruit of the Spirit, today I'm going to produce some fruit. I'm going to be loving. That's it. Got love going on. But it's like this straining after fruit. Have you ever walked by an apple tree and heard it grunt to pop out an apple? You walk by the apple pot. No, it's this natural growth that takes time through a season, right? It's this very natural growth. And that's the problem with spiritual growth is it feels so slow and natural, just like it takes time for the apples to grow on the tree. It takes time for the oranges to grow on the tree. It takes time for us to grow. So it is an act of the will, though, because I do want these things. And this specific love is a decision that means I can be patient with you. If I'm going to love you, I'm going to prefer you above myself. You know, when you might hold the door for somebody, say, after you. That's an illustration that just starts to happen in life where you're like, hey, how can I serve you? Because love is concerned with you. Now, before then, life was all about me. Before Jesus, I don't care about you. Get your own door. Get your, who, you know, get me a drink of water. You know, are your legs broke? Who died and made you the boss? I mean, we got all these phrases. I grew up as the youngest of four going, you're not the boss of me. <laughs> Nobody's the boss. I'm going to, but love begins to say, hey, is it, there's something that happens supernaturally as God's love starts working in you and now you're loved by him, that love begins to flow to you then towards others. You start wanting to be a different person in love, kinder. Because here it tells us that this uh, fruit of the spirit of love and joy, people want to be happy, but joy is different than happiness. Happiness is kind of some outside work. Like if I get the car, I'll be happy. If I get the house, I'll be happy. If I get the job, I'll be happy. Joy is an inside job. As I'm just deeper in love with God, joy just starts bubbling up. And I have this genuine, lighthearted joy that I couldn't have with trying to achieve it out here somewhere. It's happening naturally as fruit as I'm drawing close to the Lord. And I have this new tranquility and this peace. Right? It's this rest for the soul. Every single, if you only took the first three things, I tell people, Everybody in the world, everybody you work with, everybody in your neighborhood, everybody in your family, everybody in your school, everybody in your neighborhood, wherever they are, everybody on your team, what do they want? They want to be loved. They want to be accepted. They want to have true joy in their hearts. They want laughter and joy. 
and they want peace because they're anxious, they're insecure, they're afraid, they're lonely, they're sad, there's sorrow. They can't sleep at night because they're just fret. They're just nervous. I don't know how it's all going to work out. I don't know. I've chewed off my fingernails and I've been trying to reach my toenails. I'm trying to go after everything. Right? And there's, I, I don't have any peace. But as I, what do I do? Oh, I change my mindset and I trust the Lord. Lord, help me love this person. Help, help me. I'm powerless. I, I need your help. And you know, and if you try to do this in your own effort, in your own strength, you will continue at this till God finally allows you to crash and burn in your life because you've been trying to do it on your own strength. Watchman Nee shares a story of, he's a famous missionary in China. He shares a story of being at a river and somebody was drowning in the river. And he was there, and he was observing this whole conversation. And these guys were, none of them knew how to swim, but one guy said, they asked him, do you know how to swim? He goes, I, I know how to swim a little bit. I'm not a very strong swimmer. And they said, well, go save him. And he goes, no, no, I'm not going to. And the guy started to go down. And they said, go save him. And he said, no, I'm not going to. And then when the guy went down and then slowly came up like he was, up, he just, he was giving up. Then he dove in, and then he rescued him, and he pulled him to the shore. And when they came out, the guy looked at him and said, I would have wanted to make you a hero and tell, said that you were a real champion, but because you let him almost drown, I have nothing good to say to you. How dare you do that? And the guy said, no, you don't understand. I told you I can swim just a little bit. And I knew as long as he continued to thrash really strong, he was going to drown himself and me. I had to wait for him to collapse and be weak and totally give up. Then I could help him. Then I could rescue him. And he won't drown me, and I can save him. And some of us have been drowning. The Lord's just waiting for you to finally come to the end of yourself. You can't love your husband the way you've been trying to. You can't love your wife the way that you need to. You can't love your enemy at work like you need to. Why? Because you have to just get out, you know what, I can't do this. That's what I tell the Lord. If I hate somebody's guts, which I still have the gift of doing, <laughs> it's a tremendous natural gift. I didn't work for it, I just have it. My prayer life's really honest. I just say, Lord, you know I hate this guy's face. I mean, I hate him. I hate his face. I hate his voice. I just want to spit in his face. But God, you want me to love him. You want me to love my enemies. So I'm here telling you I'm helpless to do the right thing here. I just can't love. I just, I lack the resources. So I'm going to change my mindset, which is what? I hate your guts. I want to spit in your face. <laughs> so I change my mindset in my mind, and I go, Jesus... I trust you to help me. And I experienced this infusion of power through simple repentance and trust. How do I come to Jesus? Through repentance and trust. How do I grow? Repentance and trust. How do I bear fruit? Repentance and trust. Whatever my attitude that stinky is, when I'm not, I don't have joy, I'm like, Lord, you want the fruit of the Spirit to be joy, but I'm just like a little pouty mess. And so... I just pray as I spend time with you and read your word and prayer, there would be a natural joy that bubbles up, a peace, a rest, a long-suffering, which means patience with people. The Bible says it uses the word patience in the King James when it has to do with circumstances and long-suffering when it is with people. As he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, he says that love is patient and kind. That means, because some people are saying, I'm, so, I'm long-suffering, it's just like you're biting your tongue at work with this person in the next cubicle that's driving you absolutely crazy. I was coming to the church this morning and there's somebody that greeted me the last couple of times that really irritated me. And uh, so I, I'm walking across the parking lot and I'm like, Lord, I just have to repent. My attitude sinks. And I want to greet this person and be loving. That's what you want. So I'm changing. But would you give me the strength and the power? And behold, what do you know? I walked through the doors and there they were. Right on time for me to be able to exercise exactly what I had the opportunity to do. Which God gave me the grace to do it. And I'm so thankful on the walk across the parking lot that I could have that conversation about something real that was about ready to happen in real time in just a couple of minutes. You see, us preachers, we're just a big hot mess. 
And we need God's grace to help us. But if I'm not a mess and I don't know how, if I'm a mess and I don't know how to get strength to walk in love and walk in joy and walk in peace and be long-suffering with people, how in the world am I going to share with other people that struggle with the exact same things how to do it? You see, God doesn't give us a free pass. As a matter of fact, he gives us an extra dose of garbage. That's French for garbage, if you didn't know. So that we can learn how to walk in the Spirit. So we can share with other struggling people how to walk in the Spirit. This dynamic that he continues on, and we're out of time, but, you know, kindness, just being the kindness of God flowing through you, the goodness, which is just a genuine, like your life is good. It means it's beneficial to you, your family, everybody. Just people that are around you, there's a goodness, a beneficiality that goes to the people around you. There's a faithfulness, there's a gentleness, there's a self-control. The fruit of the spirit of self-control, that means to be able to say yes to the right things and no to the wrong things. That's what the fruit of the spirit is, of self-control. All these things, you you don't obtain them by a direct pursuit. You obtain them by growing in your walk with the Lord. And naturally, they begin to invade your life. Right? They naturally begin to take over. So what you want to do is, I'm, don't go leave here today. I'm going to be good. I'm gonna, no. Get your eyes on the Lord. Spend time with him in the word and prayer. And just do that consistently and you're sowing to the spirit. And pretty soon, three months from now, six months from now, you're going to realize, wow, I, I seem to have more self-control in my life. Why? Because that's the fruit of spending time. Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. But if you abide in me, which means to be grafted into the life that Jesus offers... Then you'll bear much fruit, and then every branch of him that bears fruit, he prunes so that you're more fruitful. He allows you to come into a better, more fruitful place. Well, with us running out of time, at the end of verse 23, it says, against such things there is no law. Hey, you guys seen any laws or placards or speed limit signs or anything that, that you, you, you shall not love? You shall not be joyful today? You may not be patient. That's against the law. You may not be (laughs) long-suffering. Wouldn't it be crazy if there were signs like that, right? Now, some people have it written on their face when you show up at work. (laughs) Right? I used to show up at 6 in the morning at the gang box at a construction. I was a tile setter in Las Vegas in the Flamingo Hilton, and they have this gang box where everybody puts their tools and it's locked up, and then they open it up, and everybody gets their tool buckets out and goes to do the marble work that we're going to do. But I would show up because I, sp- I got up at 5, and I read a chapter of my Bible and prayed to Jesus on the way to the casino. <laughs> to where I work. And uh, read my Bible over a bowl of Cheerios, my favorite, Honey Nut Cheerios gr- growing up. And uh, my Bible, I started having these pages stick together so I could have these little milk splashes, you know, in my Bible. I'm just a construction worker. I'm no preacher. I'm nothing. I'm just like, hey, I, I just love Jesus and I want to read my Bible. And when I go to work, I'm like, well, Lord, I don't know what you want to do today, but here I am. Do whatever you want. I'd show up at the game box, you know, at or always early, or five, five till six. And I would be there at six in the morning like this. I don't know I'm smiling. Like, I just go through life that way. I don't know I'm doing it. So I just think I'm standing there. But I got this, and the guys would slowly walk, and it's Vegas. I mean, these guys, every one of them coming from horrendous backgrounds and hung over. Some didn't even sleep all night. And some just lost their, you know, uh, check on Friday. They gambled it away. And on Monday, they're flat broke again. And their wife's a meth addict. And, you know, their kids were just taken away by ch- children's services. These are the guys that show up at the game box. And they walk, and when they'd look at me, they'd get just so disgusted. I had one guy tell me, why don't you blankety blank get that look off your face? Nobody deserves to look like that. It's sex in the morning. I'm like, well, Mr. Grumpy Pants. <laughs> I just smile because, you know, just a few years before that, I showed up at the gang box just like that. What's the difference? Jesus. How did I grow in the spirit to have joy in the morning? Just by changing my mind to embrace his thoughts and then trust him to be the power, the source of the power that I needed. And to do that one day at a time until the days turn into weeks and the weeks turn into months 
and the months turn into years. Spiritual growth is very slow. Don't be discouraged. That you even want it proves that you are alive in Jesus. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your kindness and your goodness. We pray that you would do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think by your spirit right now. We are drowning people that coming to the end of ourselves, we realize, Lord, would you help us? Would you give us a hunger for spiritual things so that we can grow in spiritual things? Would you give us a hunger to read your word and talk to you and be with your people? Would your spirit just lead and guide and direct us in a special way? Lord, I pray that you would forgive us, Lord, because that step of repenting and trust. Lord, please forgive us for having a mindset that we think that there's real fulfillment in the list of the flesh and just how empty those things leave us. Lord, we pray that as we sow to the Spirit that we would see evidence that your love is growing, your joy is growing, your peace is growing in our hearts. Lord, I pray that um, you would be the lifter of our heads. Jesus, I'm so mindful as I approach this, this, this service couldn't help but thinking about what you told the Pharisees, that they put these great heavy burdens on the people's backs and they don't even use one finger to lift that heavy load of condemnation and responsibility and all of this stuff. And Lord, my heart was the exact opposite. As your people came in here with burdens on their back, Lord, sincerely, it was my desire through your compassion, the truth of your word, the work of your spirit to lift any condemnation on their hearts, to lift any sense of failure in their life, to lift their eyes to you, Jesus, that they can just simply look to you and have you cleanse all of us, Lord, of our sins, how we fall short, and we most certainly do. But then to look to you and trust you to fill us with the power of your spirit to be who you want us to be. Sincerely, Lord, to be who you've created us to be. You've put a new heart in us. You've put a new desire in us. You've put a new strength and power in us, Lord. We're not under the law. You've put a new desire inside of us simply to obey you and to honor you and to reap the benefits of your love, your joy, and your peace by simply hanging out with you. So, Lord, I pray that you would be the lifter of the heads and the hearts of your precious people here today. I pray that you, as their good shepherd, that they would know in their hearts that the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He may, like, makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. Lord, may there would be a deep rest, a deep sense of love, a deep sense of joy in each heart here today. That with a childlike faith, we simply trust you as being our good shepherd, our loving savior, our kind father, and our precious spirit to come alongside and help us. We ask it, Lord, in your grace. In Jesus' name.